projects for major OEMs um, for a long time, connecting devices, but now we're uh, really seeing the acceleration and the real value propositions coming for some of our customers. So today, I'm gonna focus on some of the hardware that we're doing for OEMs, and I'll give you a quick snapshot of the business, and um, feel free to chime in with any level of question that you want. If you wanna uh, talk about some specific part of our solutions, the goal today is to have an open, open discussion and hopefully everybody walks out of here with some excitement and some ideas to go out and improve your products and your solutions you're doing. Um, so with that, um, uh, our company was uh, started uh, by two uh, individuals in the early 2000s. We're based in Pleasanton, California. Uh, Bo and uh, Eason are the two founders of it. We went through about four or five name changes um, in our tenure. Um, some key, th key points about us, we've been profitable every year. Uh, we've been acquired, um, and that's how I met the team in 2006. Uh, the company I was working for, uh, Applied Data Systems, um, based out of Maryland, we designed embedded computers. Back then there was the strong arm processor, and then we got hooked up with Intel and we started doing the Intel and we acquired Vantron um, to augment our design services and, and portfolio products. And so I've been working with the team since 2006, um, managing products, helping product development, and for a stint I was a business development manager for uh, our cloud platform. Today I'm really focused on major OEMs and partnerships like M&A to solve problems and um, grow our business. So roughly we, this is a little bit old, but we're about up to about 250 employees, 150 engineers. Um, our, our major businesses are embedded computer systems, tablets, and uh, IoT. Um, we, we pursue long-term partnerships, and uh, we have the ability to uh, turnkey. And so um, you'll see some of our products that we're bringing to market, and uh, I was listening to some of the resumes of the people in the room. I'm not sure if, if you're down in the minutia of these, this level of uh, information about the processors, but um, in the IoT space, these uh, portfolio of processors um, are kind of bubbling to the top to be the de facto best in class um, solution providers. One of the uh, partners that we have is Texas Instruments. This is kind of exciting driving by. One of my first business trips was to the uh, DRAM wafer fab back in um, probably 89, August of 89. So I, I've been involved with the semiconductors uh, since then. I haven't been back at TI, but we've adopted a lot of the TI portfolio and they're excellent, reliable, um, low power, low cost, long life embedded processors with great I.O. So our company starts from like very low end microcontrollers um, with built for purpose I.O. all the way up to we're doing uh, Xeon processors for servers. And so everywhere in the middle of that is some type of uh, connectivity device. Another part of our portfolio uh, from our uh, beginning, we were doing um, IPTVs and video over IP for fitness equipment. And then really what brought me here today is our wireless uh, connectivity piece. So we've been involved with the uh, connectivity as the um, wireless radios became lower cost and, and more companies can adopt them. We've been um, brought into some projects by OEMs to help them do it, and now we've come to market with our own standard products that startups can adopt to, um, you know, Fortune 100 companies like Berkshire can adopt, and uh, everywhere in between. And probably one of the biggest uh, value adds we bring to these um, projects is our support for Windows, Linux, and Android. So we, we handle everything from the microcontroller, the firmware, to the OS, and then out of necessity, because the ecosystem hasn't been so robust over the last 10 years, we've had to actually go out and integrate middleware, develop uh, frameworks on our devices, and then 
plug into the best in class platform. So there's a couple of people in the room that have these platforms. And so um, we've uh, been involved with ground up IoT platforms hosted on our own servers. We've been involved with pushing data to IBM, to Intel's analytic engines, ThingWorks. There's literally dozens of these platforms that our hardware has to communicate securely, reliably, and uh, cost effectively. And so we've got a unique skill set for a hardware manufacturer. And so I think originally when I talked to David, I was going to talk more about the software piece of our business where we're doing it, but I think there's some thirst for these groups to see how hardware is actually put together. And we have some unique ways to do it. But if you want to ask any of the questions about the, you know, the typical guys like Amazon or IBM, uh, what our vantage point is and what we're doing with them, feel free to, to, to do it. So um, that's, these are the focus products we're doing. And now I'll kind of drill into some of the more focused um, things that we're actually selling in the market. So it's single board computers. Does everybody know what a single board computer is? Um, there's industry standard form factors. It's really that it's, uh, it's grown over the last 10, 15 years and there's um, some major players in it. Intel um, actually had a uh, single uh, com board computer business unit and they've uh, standardized on some footprints. My company has done that, so we make mini ITX boards, Com Express boards. Um, there's a three and a half inch size. We make all of those with ARM processors, Intel processors, and server processors. And so um, <coughs> customers come to us for that. We just sell a single board computer and um, load the operating system, and, and we solve problems that way. The most exciting part of it, what I'm really uh, jazzed about is this IoT um, gateways and connectivity devices. And so we built a whole portfolio of connected devices. Intel coined the word smart service gateways uh, a few years ago and I've, we've kind of adopted it. And so as companies like you start bringing more and more applications to market, these gateways become more um, dependent for the adding services to existing deployments. And we're, I'll talk about that and how we're actually solving it. And then the tablets and HMIs, um, I brought some show and tell um, of some existing specialty tablets that we bring in for specific markets. Um, so um, how we got into the business is doing single board computers and uh, application ready devices. And so for 17 years we've been um, going to the market, interviewing companies, big companies, um, that have a requirement for some type of uh, embedded uh, processor, and we've been very event-driven. So we will typically be bleeding or early to market with the latest processor. So with um, Texas Instruments, we'll not typically be the first one to get the uh, board support up, but we will have a development kit. It may not be the device that's deployed, um, but it'll get someone up and running with an operating system, the I.O. Typically, they'll be able to do 80 to 90% of their application, prove it out, and then come back to come me or themselves and then spin on a purpose-built device and then bring that to market. And that business model has been used over and over by a lot of companies. Today, um, companies are uh, adopting a different model by Raspberry Pi or Adrenos. Let me ask the question, is, has anybody bought a Raspberry Pi in the room? Okay, so uh, if you would have asked that question um, 10 years ago, um, have you bought an Adreno or a Beagle board? There'd be some hands. Well, how many people have the Beagle board? Okay, this is TI's backyard. I thought there'd be more, but um, we've been kind of in that space, very focused on not the hobbyist market, but to the OEMs. The crossover is kind of taking place right now, and I've been promoting to our CEO that we should be making some um, devices that play off of that ecosystem because when I go into companies like <laughs> 
John Deere or Caterpillar or Berkshire or ITW, Dover, you go into these labs, you see these uh, starter kits. And historically, back in the 2000s and the, uh, even 10 years ago, companies, big companies would want to do their proof of concepts. We would get pulled in very early because typically the I.O. on these new processors weren't wrung out. And I, we have engineers that are, are, we're bringing out those interfaces reliably. Now the, the uh, OEMs, there's not a lot of OEMs in the room here, but there's a few. Now the OEMs, over the weekend, they can take information from their CTO or their um, head of engineering and get an uh, application running Monday morning. They can be showing something live. Just a few years ago, that's a three to six week process by bringing stuff in. So now uh, companies like Admet and Arrow, um, they're, uh, they're seeing it and they're, they're acquiring these companies to make it easier. So we've, um, we've kind of fit into that ecosystem for taking some of those hobbyist boards that are now becoming more reliable and mature and then spinning them to spec. So my company today is probably building four or five computers this week for some OEM in the world, and they are companies all over the map. There's um, um, big companies and small companies, and so we've kind of ironed this process down of starting them off with a, 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 a standard board, board like this, and then interviewing them, and then cutting a board to, to spec. And uh, we've grown up over the over the years doing this, and we don't just do the boards. We'll We'll integrate into completed systems, and we'll handle the certifications. Um, here's a more like detailed overview, and some of you may may know these architectures, but just at the high level, we're designing the Intel pretty much the whole portfolio. There's you can't do all of them; that's just so deep. But uh, in the embedded space. Um, we did the, all of the latest and greatest. So we're doing the um, Apollo Lake is the hot one. So I don't know if there's anybody in the room know what the Apollo Lake is. Okay, so this is, a, this is a really a cool Intel processor. It's designed for IoT applications. It's got a very uh, embedded centric uh, IO set. So um, it's going into designs that I'm doing uh, gas station pump POS systems. Um, we're doing um, several designs for Bosch for automotive diagnostics. It's it's making its way into medical. And the beauty beauty about it, it's not on the laptop or the tablet uh, life cycle. It's embedded. So the predecessor of it, the Bay Trail that's up here, that is um, been out for ten years and it's designed in some really high profile IoT applications like Cisco uses it in one of their uh, routers. John Deere uses it in their advanced farming systems for doing satellite uh, automated crop management. And there's a host of other companies that are just using this very high powered processor. You know, it's uh, quad core, uh, multiple gigahertz SKUs, it's available in negative 40 plus 85, so you can embed this and do some really cool aggregation and not worry about putting on special uh, software. So we've seen it, uh, Intel really helped the IoT space by coming out with these embedded processors that are around for 7 to 20 years. Go ahead. Uh, how many of them can run ML? So ML. How many of them? How many? Uh, Which of these processes can handle uh, machine learning in front of the edge? Okay, so we can go into the machine learning. So um, repeat the question. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. How many of these processors can run AI or machine learning algorithms at the edge? That's right. So the Intel is perfect for it. And these are x86 instructions. So. Pretty much what you're developing on your uh, PCs, that in your development suites, now there's always fine print, um, can run on these embedded processors. That's one of the benefits of this architecture is 
there's a whole ecosystem of companies out there that have developed on their laptops and their desktops and they moved them down to these embedded devices. Where me personally, I'm, I'm seeing most of my designs in these ARM processors strictly on price. But if you want to get to market quickly, and some of my largest IoT programs, I'll profile a few of them, companies, big companies like Dyke and McQuay, uh, largest AC company in the world, Parker Hannafin, the one of the you know nut and bolt industrial factory companies. They're using the Intel architecture because long life, very stable architecture, and a very rich ecosystem. So this Intel one, there there is a couple of my customers um, that are actually doing machine learning. A few of them are startups, but they've been doing. Um, machine tool, uh, machine learning for about six years on this architecture, and uh, it's perfect for it because you don't have to have a team of BSP or BIOS guys to optimize the operating system. It just, it's Intel that comes in and it works, so um, it's a great process. The um, other thing that Intel has done is they come out with some high-end core processors that we put into some interesting devices, and I'll, I'll show a few of them to you in a bit. And then these, um, really I think what's gonna fuel the adoption rate to get it to the billions of units that everybody says is coming, it's gonna have to be these low, low cost processors. And so the ones that we see kind of fueling it right now is TI, I have NXP Freescale, if I was here a few months, it would have been Qualcomm. <laughs> and so, um, and then Rockchip. So, I'm gonna teach you something today. How many people know about Rockchip? Okay, so one guy, and he's with Abnet. So, um, proof will be in the pudding. I predict next year, you guys will pretty much all know who Rockchip is. So they're a fabulous semiconductor company based in China. <laughs> So, okay, why are they important? Over the last uh, 10 years, about 30% of the low-cost tablets that came into the United States had a rock chip, all winner, or one other fabulous semiconductor company in China. Rock chip is the one that's kind of bubbled up. 2014, Intel invested in them. Intel put money into them to develop a atom with cellular system on chip. And um, we got involved with them about six years ago. We couldn't come to meetings like this and talk about rock chip until Intel validated them. You couldn't go into Brunswick's Life Fitness Division and say, hey, they've been using NXP for 15 years and Intel. You couldn't go in there and say, hey, here's a fabulous semiconductor company, use their processor. And so, uh, rock chip is hot right now, and one of the things that they're hot in, um, we participate in different segments. One is a digital design segment. So I did booth duty in Vegas two, two months ago, and all of the digital sign guys that you see in North America were there, and they would come by and ask questions. The trend in the digital sign space is an Intel Atom processor on an HDMI that plugs into any monitor. That is now your digital sign. It's connected to the internet. The new trend is a rock chip system on chip plugged into the HDMI or a little thing, and you it serves up content. And it drives HDMI, it drives DVI, it drives LVDS, and it's a very high-performance ARM processor and they go from very low cost, a couple dollars, to into the teens that are equivalent to some of the Intel processors. The drawback to the portfolio is it doesn't run Windows. That's a drawback, but there's some really cool ecosystems developing around Android and Linux. Our company, why I'm kind of jabbering on it, is we were the first one to do a Linux BSP because all of the low cost tablets are running Android. So we did a Linux BSP about seven, eight years ago and we brought it to market for them. Now the, the whole portfolio is available with Android or Linux. And 
in the IoT space, if you don't have an ecosystem of these software partners, the silicon and the boards will just sit there. And so Rockchip is now very tightly coupled to major companies. So the Chromebooks that you see at Best Buy, there's a couple of Acers there running a, a Rockchip processor. You don't really see Rockchip branding very well because they're, they're just getting going. And then um, Samsung is using Rockchip in a lot of consumer products that you wouldn't think of. They're washing machines. We've adopted it across the portfolios and then this last year, my channel partners, I'm going into OEMs talking about Rockchip or NXP or Intel. So when we have these discussions with OEMs, they, they want to know that one of the biggest discussions is which one of these processors do they want to pick for their programs? And each one of these has their best value proposition. And for whatever reason, Rockchip is bubbling to the top right now. So why we're here? Okay, so um, we make a portfolio of cellular routers and uh, gateways that host these embedded computers and microprocessors. And so, um, Companies started coming to us um, 2007 timeframe, and we came to market with a whole portfolio of smart service cellular routers and gateways. So we did the 2G, the 3G. We just we're still moving some of our customers to the 4G, but they're they're based upon these microprocessors that I was um, talking about, and then we marry them up with best in class wireless technologies and protocols. And so there's a whole industry of uh, connected devices that uh, will have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and cellular kind of standard. But then there's this tremendous amount of install base that doesn't have wireless connectivity. And that's one of the things my company is helping you know, partnerships uh, with other companies go out and satisfy. So. Um, things like um, refrigerators that are storing blood. There's literally hundreds of thousands of these refrigerators in labs at universities, at um, pharmaceutical companies, and the way that those things are monitored today is just kind of crazy. They have some of these things are, are still with paper rolls. Some will go out to these refrigerators and and so what we've been doing is helping those types of applications update and add connectivity to existing assets. And so that is where the huge growth for our company is because all of the new designs for treadmills, uh, telematics, telematics people in here, um, microwave ovens, every, uh, rest, all of them will come with connectivity now. So one of the things that we're working with companies like M&A is find these big install bases, help the company develop a business model to go out and start connecting their existing assets. And that's what our, our cellular routers and gateways do. And we're, it's kind of unique what we put together here is there's people that you've heard of gateways. There's companies in my space like Digi, Digi Multitech, um, Cradle Point, these are people that are making these purpose-built connectivity devices. These are very successful companies solving like big problems. Our company came about it a little bit different. We came from making computers, running operating systems, to now we've take those and we package them and bring them into different vertical markets. So um, we start with a really high-end ones, and then we add these, and these aren't just logos, we're actually putting these into products that we're shipping as certified with applications on with all these wireless technologies. Is there any wireless technology that um, you don't see up there that you're using? Does anybody have some um, something new that's coming? I don't see 5G yet. That's a great question. <laughs> Say what? That's a good, that's a good one. So what was it? Satellite. Satellite, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we're an engineering company. Or go ahead. You have no LoRa gateways up there. 
I got Laura here. I got the buzzword. Well, you got the buzzword there, but you're not showing any. I'm going to show a couple in a minute, and I have some real ones that I can show uh, to, to you guys. And then, uh, to speak to Laura, M&A is very uh, proactive, our partner here, about the Laura. The reason they brought me down here is to talk about Laura. <laughs> so I will, I will talk about Laura. Is there any other ones? The 5G one was a good one, the LTE. So there's some things I worked on. I was uh, um, an early adopter of Sigfox. Has anybody heard of Sigfox? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I was I actually, we were um, in my tenure of my job, whatever, um, they allowed me to start a company a few years ago. It was called the IoT Architecture Group. And so um, 12 engineers, and we did designs. Um, came out with a little wireless module. Got it on a dev kit on Amazon's AWS platform. We did uh, three or four consumer products, a wireless charger for Sears Diehard brand. We did a sump pump. And we did um, a, a few other consumer products with Wi-Fi. A few years ago, that was a complex thing. Now, it's commoditized. And so when we were doing that to augment that business, we became a Sigbox partner. And so, um, Sigfox isn't on here because we couldn't make money at it uh, just with our skill set, but it is another one that's very pervasive in the in the, uh, North America. Go ahead. You're missing CBRS and white space. Yep, you're right. So, point being, and for asking this, there is not one single protocol or wireless technology that will solve this. You know, so a lot of the things that we're doing, one of them I'm going to profile in a little bit. Uh, use a proprietary 900 megahertz radio. And there is a tremendous number of IoT applications that have really smart engineers that have developed their own radio, their own software stacks, and they work. And so we're integrating these, but we, we're a big advocate of adopting industry standards and partnering and helping you know, move things forward. And so uh, LoRa is a, is a really cool technology, and the narrowband IoT is a, a cool technology that's new. So here is our portfolio. So it's low end to big end. <laughs> and so there's different IP ratings. So I'll just quickly go through why we developed them, because most of these were de developed for a customer and OEM application. The one at the end, um, and I'll start, I'll pass these around. This box root originally was developed for Trimble as a um, in the field uh, box that would have a solar cell hooked up to it. And it, all it would do is every once in a while wake up, aggregate some sensors, and uh, push the data to a back end. It wasn't our back end, but we know how to make low power gateways. First version had a small battery, the second one had a bigger battery. So this is our kind of like entry level. We have a version of a Cortex M4, which is a, a really low cost microcontroller for the people in the room that don't really get into the minutia of the part numbers. But this is a dollar, two dollar microcontroller. And then we married up the radios with it. So this is a complex thing. We just recently adopted it with a TI Cortex A8 processor. And then it's mainstream. So anything you run on the Beagle board or these hobby boards with a Linux distribution will run on this. And so I've, I've got some cool design wins with this. Um, I'll pass this around. This is IP rated. It'll sit in the field and run off a solar cell or runs in a battery. We had a, a startup in Minneapolis um, adopted it. Her company was called Backpack EMR. She would go into third world countries and she'd get uh, some, some money. She had a fleet of about 30 iPads and she would use that box as the aggregator for all the iPads to push the data back to uh, the command center. Would either be, um, it would either be one of the medical universities, it wasn't Mayo Clinic, but um, then the doctors would have their um, recipe for the, the, the um, surgery or the, the work the next day. So we used that, and so the key features of that box was lightweight, it had to work outside, it went back in, her, her company was called Backpack, and, and they had to, to bring it. Then we go all the way up, and so the, the LV uh, device, I, I have- a question. I, need, I, I need a question, yep. and maybe nobody else. Because, so I'm an application software guy. Okay. So I think you just said 
that box rather runs Linux. That box runs Linux. That's so a, you're saying, I, so yeah. that me, because I'm an applications guy, yeah. right? So all I, I don't know about how the hell you guys make this stuff work. Yeah. But I plug in with my USB port and I've developed an app uh, that runs on whatever version of Linux that thing supports and I just download my app and it runs. There's some fine print in there, but that, but that is what the Raspberry Pi and the Drino and the Intel, that's what these Linux little oh, yeah, starter no, kits. Oh yeah, I know, that's what they do. I'm asking, you said that does it too. Yes, and so what our value proposition for the room or for the ecosystem okay. is we've taken that little Linux module and then we've ruggedized it, certified it, and got it approved on the carriers. And so that's a mouthful is to take that little Linux Raspberry Pi device and then package up radios and um, then go out and deploy it in a different country. And so um, the Linux is, that is a key thing to that, and I, I mentioned that. And so okay, thank you. all of these boxes are Linux boxes. We have uh, probably about five different distros of Linux that we're uh, deploying. So I'll throw out the buzzwords for the team. Uh, Wind River Linux is based upon Yocto now, but we did do some previous versions of Wind River. It's a great, great, secure, reliable, great tools. And these boxes, probably half of them support the Wind River Linux with that pedigree. There is also a, just an open source Yocto that these boxes run. There is a, a Ubuntu Core and Ubuntu. There's Debian. So like all of you Linux developers, you have your, your favorite recipe. We kind of come about it is we'll put a few of them out there and it'll be working 100%. And then if you have your distribution that you trust, we work on projects to move it over to that Linux distribution. And not only is it Linux distribution, it's the middleware and frameworks. So these frameworks now, there's um, OSGI frameworks, there's QT frameworks, there's all kinds of frameworks now that are helping even get to market faster. And so that's the other thing that these boxes do host is these industrial Internet of Things clients and frameworks. And so each cloud platform, Amazon's got their client or their methodology, Wind River, Intel at their time, they had theirs. IBM had theirs. All of the platform guys for the IoT had special middleware that went along with the with this. And so our our point here is we, we make a very low end gateway to, all the way up to some high end gateways. And so I'll just point out a couple other ones that are cool, just as I, I think they're cool. So this gateway, uh, Keysight, Agilent, so everybody in here probably knows what a scope is. And so um, we got into the business doing these Wi-Fi connectivity devices. So everything's being connected. Some things don't need to be connected, <laughs> like a battery charger that sold at Sears for $60. I don't know if that's one of those devices that really had a compelling reason, but oscilloscopes, instruments, that's a big, that's, a, that's an important thing for teams that have their developers all over the world. So we got pulled into it to help them connect assets and devices that were remote. And so this device, the uh, C335, and we have, we're engineers, we're not the uh, greatest marketing people, so you won't see all these fancy <laughs> names, but the 335 is a very reliable low-end gateway. And um, so what we did, and I'll pass this one around, we've just developed it and allowed customers that have an, a, a stable platform start connecting in. And so the recipe of this gateway is a couple of Ethernet ports, and LTE, Wi-Fi. And so um, we package it, and sometimes there's an uh, enclosure around it, sometimes it's just the embedded board. But um, it's, it's going into applications that require low-cost, reliable connectivity. And then I'll move up to the, the kind of that higher-end part of our portfolio is this Intel Bay Trail uh, device. And so that is like, everything 
under the sun is integrated to that device. So we have multiple Ethernets, CAN bus, J1935, J1939. Um, we have vehicle power supply. We have uh, backup. We put encryption ASICs in these devices. Do, uh, is, are people using TPMs? Does everybody know what a TPM is? Yeah. So a couple of you do. So um, to get all these gateways connected to the internet, the security is usually one of the questions that comes up to us right away. You know, how are these reliable? So these Linux distributions and uh, middleware that are on these gateways, there's very smart companies we're adopting. There's, there's schemes. One of the requirements that we now do automatically is we put in a hardware encryption microcontroller or ASIC on these devices. So each one of these gateways has software methodologies to secure the connection to the platform, but we also do hardware encryption. Intel has some great features built into their silicon, but um, we still put down devices like the Atmel microchip. These are low cost specialty purpose devices that handle security keys, encryption keys, certificate management for Amazon's AWS interconnect. So all of these devices have that ASIC there. There's a lot of companies that are just using regular best practice software security methodology. When we are in the discussion on these programs, we'll recommend it. Some of our biggest clients will have redundant security on these devices just because where they're going. They're going on rooftops of buildings, they're going into schools, they're going to med medical facilities, so security is a big deal. And so the Intel one has uh, a couple of processors in it. Uh, they're depopulated a lot of times because um, the market is just getting going now with the standard security features. Go ahead. As a former hacker, uh, all the hackers in the world would like to recommend not to use TPM modules. Yep. They're very hard to hack, so please use your software solution. It's much easier for us to find. Touche. But this TPM is a big deal, and uh, um, lessons learned with uh, these technologies. Uh, if you have a couple of startups in here, some of these things you don't have to invent the wheel on. There's really good partners out there. So these silicon manufacturers are trying to solve some of the major problems. But uh, TPMs is, is definitely something that will be, become more and more prevalent uh, as this IoT thing builds out. So all Linux, does, do you support Windows with any of them? or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let me go. So here is the, these are the, <laughs> these are the distributions we're currently supporting. In the Windows world, my background it was doing these little embedded ones, so we started out with Windows CE, went through all the Windows CE, now in the, in the embedded space. What's really cool about Microsoft is we're seeing a lot of programs now being able to adopt it. They've really dropped the price of their um, run times. So in the embedded space, you think of the XP, you're, you know, $80, $90. It's not like that anymore. So they have a, a very low cost embedded IoT software. And so we're now seeing customers start asking us about Windows, IOT, Windows 10 IoT embedded. There's like, a, <laughs> their names just keep going on. But we support all of those. And um, what we do is we strip them down and just build them to what's, what's there. There's a, uh, m and has got a rich history of doing value add with um, operating systems like Microsoft, they're a Microsoft partner. There was about five or six years just for me managing 50 programs typically a year. I wouldn't see a very rich ecosystem of Microsoft programs, but just in the last year and a half, they're coming back strong. And they have the whole Azure and their ecosystems coming back. So watch out Android because Microsoft's coming. And we really don't have a dog in the fight on a lot of that. We just, we're, we're very event driven. So we, um, I have questions. Yep. Sorry. Do you do any, anything with Azure Sphere at all? Yeah, so it's not us. It's like guys in the room here. And so um, 
I have a couple of partners that they're putting everything in Azure. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things I see right now is that a lot of the companies are being a little bit close to the best where their applications are being hosted, just because of the Amazon and the, the battle is going on right now. And so if you're supplying into any of the retail or the grocery stores, those OEMs typically don't want to advertise where that back end is. And we're, we're kind of like the same way. We don't, we make hardware, and if you want to put this up in AWS, or you want to put it in Azure, or IBM, or Rackspace, or M&A, um, we... No, I, I actually, my question was more about you actually doing anything with the Azure Sphere board. It's called the Azure Sphere. I'm personally not. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the room uh, wants to speak to it. What is it, what is it saying? Azure what? The Azure, Azure Sphere. It's, yeah. it's the Azure Sphere. Azure Sphere is the IoT chip designed with Microsoft, which is in, in encryption and multiple chips. Right. So based on the, the um, ATX core chips, AI, right. I believe. It, it actually provides end-to-end -end security. It's got hardware root security on the board itself, going all the way up to the Azure IoT hub. So that is why we do these meetings, because there is a lot of knowledge in this room. We are the exclusive distributor. And there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, see me after, I'll show you how to Yeah, so that's a good, that's a good plug, that's a good question. Just one last question before you leave the, the uh, gateways. Do I'm you, not done on the gateways, but uh, go ahead. Did, I did, yeah, sorry, so I changed the slide. So uh, can you talk a little bit about edge gateway? Yeah. Versus, you know, just what you see is. Yeah, but I only got a little bit of that, so I want to show you some applications. But these are edge gateways. So uh, the Intel one's perfect. Um, I have a client that's hosting um, building management system. There's a company called um, Solutions Family, and they're ex Microsoft guys. They started the business about eight years ago, and they're the ones that are doing the machine learning. And so they came out of machine tools, and they, they literally know hundreds of protocols. And um, one of the things you, you find out of these buildings is the internet connection is not the best when these things are put in the basement of these buildings. So they run the whole application on these devices. It, it was being run on the Intel uh, one. We just moved them down to the, the 335. And it's an edge system, and the whole thing runs um, at on-premise. And most of the applications that I'm doing I'm involved because I'm handling some of either processing at the edge or storing forward at the edge if that connection to the platform is intermittent. And so these are all very powerful servers. The, the Intel one runs Microsoft's um, server portfolio. And so there's a most of the applications that I'm servicing right now, the process only being like 20, 30 percent, just because they're still in one application. Go ahead. Quick question: Is this the smallest form factor? Or no. I have smaller ones, so I'm going to pivot over <laughs> here. So we have all of these sizes, and this is my favorite one. This is a little one. I finished this for two Berkshire companies. This is in McDonald's. And this gets put onto um, ovens, warmers, and uh, it's our computer, and it, it's hosting a Linux operating system, and it's IP rated because so it gets sprayed down, and it's got Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, CAN, Ethernet in it. <laughs> and so, is that the M4 or the one of the bigger ones? It's not up here, and so that's why we come to these meetings. Is um, we're doing most of the stuff for our revenue is not on our website. Give us a price point. Good question. So that box that I just put on, uh, that thing right there is, is running around, that um, has PTCRB, AT&T, Verizon, running the um, into, uh, uh, tablet uh, module for the cellular uh, TI processor. That's a $120 device uh, through my channel partners. I have a version with category M. That's a $60 to $70 device. These are FCC, PTCRB certified. You put it on your device, and now I can start sucking air codes, uh, event data to Marmon's backend, 
Abnet's back end, and you know, there's a 200 different IoT platforms or whatever out there. And so we make these specialty devices. And so that was a good question. <laughs> what other questions? Go ahead. So from numbers perspective, you know, what are the two verticals I know which are adopting these gateways? The big ones I'm seeing right now, just on projects, is the um, the because this is IoT, but in the factories, there's huge money being spent in the factories. So, like the Abnet guys and people that are selling the components, you know, you're talking about the the industrial Internet of Things, but there's tremendous money and value being created in the factories to automate those. So that vertical is is really a, a big deal, and so. Um, Two of my biggest wins in the last few years, one was with Parker, we do their IoT gateway, the other one is Daikin. These are kind of industrial embedded, they're kind of boring, they're not sexy things like point of sale systems or you know security systems, but the nuts and bolts are running these factories, they're starting to put uh, devices in. One of the trends I see in the factories is Rockwell, ADB, all the big guys will have their systems. There's now specialty devices, now that the connectivity's um, low. Companies are putting cellular gateways in factories, bypassing the network that's in the factory, so they don't have to get on, get on the network and go through that whole six months of uh, security. And it's doing very simple things. Uh, I did a project for the company that makes the chocolate on your pillows. They had the um, fully automated system. The problem that they were having was the guys were stealing, the workers were stealing the chocolate. And, they, <laughs> and so they went to, this is a true story, they went to um, system integrator for Rockwell in the project to put a banner, uh, like light emitter, like a photo detector on the line with a software system. It came to be about $250,000 to put that in their factory. Well, <laughs> I had a consultant, um, these guys doing machine learning, they did it for 10 grand. They went and bought a couple of off-the-shelf things, one of our gateways, and then they uh, talked to their database and within a month they were able to <laughs> know where the problems were on the line and uh, we got a lot of chocolate out of it so the factories are, are one the other big one that's in the news right now is these fast food restaurants the problem that they're trying to solve is the minimum wage and the automation so there's it's coming from all over the place so they want to get rid of workers so we're doing a fair amount of projects right now to help the manager run all of the equipment or to eliminate workers, unfortunately. And I'm seeing that in a lot of places on these gateways um, where the goal of the project is to get rid of the workers. And uh, so it's sad but true. I do have to know, we're, we're actually encountering a lot of clients who have the opposite problem. They can't get workers. Yeah. They're having, <laughs> they're having to automate like a lot of remote areas and stuff like that. They just can't get people. So it, it does help solve problems too. So okay, so. Um, Keep the questions coming. <laughs> so I came here to talk about Laura, so I, I, go, I gotta go to it because I'm gonna wrap up a little bit and I wanna talk about it. So a uh, few of you knew what Laura was. Um, let me see the hands who don't know what it is. So there's a fair amount in here. So low power WAN, um, it's, it's cool. So you know what Wi-Fi is, you know what Bluetooth is, and you know what Zigbee are. This is just another methodology of getting uh, sensor data delivered to a consumer of it. And so um, Semtec is the kind of the founding caregiver of it, but it's a whole ecosystem. Go to Laura um, Partnership and uh, there's an ecosystem of, I don't even know what the number is, we're one of them. There's, you can join it, get the spec, uh, you can be an institutional, just use it. Go ahead. Laura Alliance. Laura Alliance. Laura Alliance. Dot org. Dot org. Go up to it, join it. If uh, You can test drive it, you can look at it. It's a very elegant, sexy technology. 
the real world benefits of it, it goes long range, up to multiple miles, lines of line of sight, open air, and then it penetrates in buildings and hospitals. So I personally have been involved doing studies for hospitals. I did a project for Monsanto a few years ago when it was just getting going for advanced farming, and it's everywhere. It's in building management, ballast lighting, and it's just another low cost technology that's got a very rich ecosystem around it. There's key things that you have to have on these technologies. Um, and that's why Sigfox is good, but it's very closed and it's Sigfox, you gotta deal with Sigfox. The Laura one is really starting to explode and I think that's why m and is kind of seeing the trend. Um, we started out just doing the sensors and the nodes. That's what this device in the bottom is. And then out of necessity, because Comcast, who is putting up the network, and I just looked the other day, the, the country has pretty good coverage of it right now for LoRa. So when you're, if you're looking for longer range, very small bandwidth um, delivery of sensor data, LoRa is something you should look at. A few years ago, it was still early, but there's many companies like me that are putting together solutions where you can test drive it. And one of the things that I'm doing now is I put together a development kit with two sensors, a gateway, a application, so that you can go out and just test it. And so if anybody wants to test one, get a hold of David in the back of the room from m and and uh, he'll come out and you guys can actually see how it does on your deployment. And this, you know, if it doesn't work for you, then maybe, you know, meshing Bluetooth. There's a bunch of other ways to do this, but. Laura is one you're going to hear more and more about, and Comcast is a big stakeholder in it. So Comcast allegedly will be putting up networks. What we did, um, we, we designed a sensor, but um, the, the network isn't fully up everywhere. This takes big investment. So in order for us to do these projects, we had to do our own network server. So we have a gateway with an LT backhaul and a LoRa sensor. And um, so now we can go out and do closed premise deployments with LoRa. And so that's what most of the deployments are today, is companies like me, there's about five or six companies. Multitech's a big advocate of it. Uh, there's, a, there's probably six or seven companies that have done the network server with an LT backhaul. We're one of them. and so. When the network is up, the sensor node that has a lower radio into it can talk directly to the tower, and you can go multiple miles. So you can't do that with Wi-Fi today, you can't do that with Bluetooth today, and you can't do that with Zigbee. So this is, some, I think this is a technology that, you know, investigate it if you haven't done it, and then um, it's to the point now you don't have to, go ahead. Wi-Fi 6 has long range. Yeah, so there is some Wi-Fi really long 20 mile, um, things you can get from Ubiquiti and some Qualcomm, um, Cisco, so there is Wi-Fi ones, but those are expensive, those are ex expensive deployments. What we're seeing with LoRa, when I started doing it, we started with Microchip. Microchip was the one that you could get into it really easy before um, Semtech would deal with us. Those were 10, $10, $12, you could buy them from Abnet and Arrow. You could buy those things for $10, $15, and it was a microcontroller with a radio. And you could start doing LoRa point to point. Well now, um, ST Micro is a big advocate of it. Um, I, I know that they're working on multiple spins of it to add microcontrollers. Long story short, you'll get that same radio for a couple dollars now. You can't do a couple dollar 20 mile radio with Wi-Fi. Problem with it is it's very small packets, so you can't send, you know, building management systems might want to send everything all the time. This is more of event-driven data, so like the temperature, they want to know what it is every once in a while. I have a, a deployment we're helping right now. It's being put on a shelf for Walmart. There's no electronics on the shelf. They want to put a tag on the shelf and wake up once a month and go back and tell the advertising company what shelf is there. So like if they have a Hostess Twinkies and they want to run a St. Patrick's Day special, they know what size shelf is there. Laura is perfect for that because it's tiny amounts of data, it lasts a long time, 
and um, it works. It's a very elegant technology. I'm not going to tell you about the protocol, but I'm telling you, we spent in the last two years about a million dollars in R&D on it, and now it's here. So we have to talk about it to get the money back. And so, uh, but it is, it's, there's a reason why these sensors are adopting it, and uh, it'll, it'll become more and more pervasive as Comcast and these other network providers are successful with it. Eddie, go ahead. So does this require its own infrastructure, or can it piggyback on any existing infrastructure? That's a great question. So um, one of my early projects was with uh, Nelco Ecolab, and the project was, you have to do it out of necessity. You have to have your own private premise because the networks aren't up. So, you know, you can't wait for them. So there is a gateway, but the, the design program requirements was it has to be able to switch to the network when it's up. And so today, in all reality, um, there is some Laura guys in the room that you could probably get together afterwards that are probably more intimate. And M&A has got uh, some engagements going with people that are handling whole city networks. So some of them may be further along. I'm pretty focused on projects. In my world, everything is a premise deployment, but we've designed our sensors and our gateways to be lower up compliant, so it has to work on someone else's hardware, and that's the beauty of it. You're not locked into just me. Go ahead. So Laura's RF basically is old old Z-wave basically about 900 megahertz, 400 megahertz. So uh, it, it creates its own infrastructure because it's using RF. And at some point you're doing gateway to your network, which is what the speaker was talking about. So yeah, there's a lot of great resources at the back. Come and see us; we'll be happy to show you. And David is uh, spun up on it now too. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you got to test it. You know. It's cool technology, but if it doesn't work in your use case, um, it doesn't bring a lot of value. So um, I have some tablets over here in HMIs. So we make tablets and HMIs. These are connectivity IoT devices. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we do have some cool ones. Um, my my coolest one is this tablet here. Um, this is a educational and a um, telecommunication for prisoners. We design we design tablets for prisoners. We'll deploy about a hundred thousand of these this year, and um, we got involved with it because of um, reliability, security, you know, solving problems. So we make these tablets. Um, I'll pass it around. We have them in different flavors, um, and they're educational devices. And um, they're also two-way communication. And so three million prisoners in the United States, one of the things that there's a, uh, probably half dozen companies out there trying to educate these guys and gals when they're in there to come out better. And it's really a cool project to be part of. So that tablet there, it's got a clear back and so that there's no contraband, but there is a kind of a standard specification now to deploy a device in a prison it has to not turn into a weapon. So we've done a fair amount of engineering on the mechanical. It's just a regular tablet. <laughs> and then we do an IP68 um, I, I7 tablet. This is like a Panasonic Toughbook kind of de device, but sunlight re readable. So we got a skill set in, in doing the packages. And the, then it goes up and down. We do a uh, tablet for a home security company. We're building about 40,000 of these a month for one of the big four. So if your control panel and your home security system has a keypad on it, they're all going to be PCAPs. And so we have one with cellular, and then we have little brothers that have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And then our skill set is making the computer reliable to spec. This is basically an ODM kind of scenario, and we're, we're doing these. And then we go all the way down to the little ones. This product here was for an air purifier. Uh, it's a medical company. This will be sold on uh, Amazon this Christmas. And it's a uh, assembly and it goes into an air purifier. It's got Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and under the hood it's Android so they can do remote updates and sell filters. 
And so we, we're making these types of devices from big ones to little ones. So if anybody is interested in those, get a hold of the guys. There's the tablet. We do big ones, like we have an 18 inch tablet that Dell obsolete an XPS tablet. We tooled it for a customer. Um, and some of this is a little bit boring. That's just the manufacturing. Okay, so here's some examples. I want to finish with examples. So um, I manage these programs. This is one of them for Medtronic. We do three products for Medtronic. And uh, we make the computer for uh, analytics uh, instruments. And so it's just a computer. They need a reliable way to drive these devices. After we got in there for a while, we were able to do the bypass. We make the user interface on the bypass. Very long boring programs, but they need a reliable computer with I.O. and it had to be in a certain form factor. So we've, we've been building that since about 2008. We do payment terminals, uh, tablets, you know about that. So there was a telematics guy uh, in here. So we make these smart gateways are being deployed on buses and fleets. And, you know, we're not competing with these low-cost OBD devices, but we have these smart gateways that are doing multiple things, like someone's talking about machine learning. So these have CAN bus J1939 interfaces on them, and they're driving multiple things. They're driving the digital sign, they're communicating with the bus's uh, transmission, RPM. And so you'll see more and more of that being adopted in these uh, smart trains and buses. And they wanna have best in class security, and they're all, all of it's done in the cloud. And so this is a huge um, IoT that's been out there. You're talking about smart cities and application. This, is, this has been out there for a while. Right, so what, what kind of price point are we looking at? For the, uh, and these, the, the gateway, so on the low end one I had 150, and then the, the higher end one in the 400s. So, and they're they based upon price, memory, and I.O., and then the really thing, it's the packaging, so if they're IP rated. So from the, um, from the J-Bus or the OBD2, what kind of connectivity do we need for the cable to connect to these um, the gateways or? So we, we, we do cable assembly, so okay. what we'll do is usually do a dongle, and it'll have, every vehicle manufacturer will have a Deutsch or some specialty connector. And so if, if, if our customers can't do it, uh, partners like m and or Avnet, or they have, they have solutions for it, but typically on the prototypes, I'll build up a cable assembly. They'll tell us what it is, and then we'll do the isolation and the, the fuse and the, and the thing if it's going to go on a vehicle. But these device, these gateways have wide supplies, so they're um, typically from 10 to 24 or 36 volt input ranges. So as the spikes happen, so um, they're deployed. The vending machine is a is everybody sees these things, but it's they're everywhere, and so we do just gateways, and then we actually do the little payment terminals. So this is a really cool use case for IoT, because there's NFC, cameras, everything's being put into these payment terminals. And so um, we're just one of those other companies that are involved in it. Okay, this is the one I wanted to get to before I wrapped up. This was a program I managed uh, a few years ago. It got brought into it by Intel, and uh, this is for Dyke and McQuay. So if you ever drive by the buildings, there's probably one up on the roof. So there's Daikin, there's like five big companies in the world. And these guys are the best in class making reliable chillers and blowers. And uh, you can Google this and go to the Intel site, because this is one of Intel's kind of like, they're proud of it. And uh, so we got brought in just to be the hardware guy. And so the, the problems that um, Daikin and Intel were trying to solve were, looking for someone that hosted an Intel processor because they had very sophisticated uh, analytics software that they wanted to push this data to, and they also wanted to push it to an M10 cloud platform. So there is a couple of streams of data. So we had to do some special things with security, with specific radios that Intel wanted uh, to work with their ecosystem, and then install the Wind River and be certified to solve Wind River Linux. So it wasn't like you just go pick a guy off the street that's making hardware and all of a sudden you make a secure gateway that's managing millions of dollars of asset. Uh, so it was, a, it was a fun program though because um, 
It wasn't for preventive maintenance. And I worked on the program for a year knowing that I had a connectivity gateway, an Intel Linux gateway connected to chillers. It was a year into the program, really realized the value proposition wasn't, that was key, was helping them find out when it was vibrating or the algorithms were not what they're supposed to be to roll a truck. The real value proposition for this was to save energy. And so part of the gateway project was a current sensor. And there's only three companies in the world that are authorized to build a sensor for Intel, we're one of them. So the technology came out of Intel's labs in Phoenix, so it was an R&D, and it's a current sensor that goes on the chillers to monitor the um, amount of power. So at peak loads during the day, New York, Chicago, Dallas, where they need, they need power back to the grid, this system is the mechanism for it. So they ramp down those chillers and blowers just a little bit and at tremendous power savings, and that's where the real money is. And so the typical MDM stuff that we're all aware of is preventive maintenance, remote management. There's all kinds of new uh, cool applications that are coming, and uh, that's why these uh, gateways with cellular connectivity and all these connectivities are the kind of the vehicle for it. And so what the application is that, you know, like the next killer application, that's really up to everybody out here. And we're really focused on one, one small part of the ecosystem making these gateways with standard, reliable Linux operating system security and then the right I.O. And, uh, you know, if there's a project that anybody wants to see how we did it, um, come to us and we will share with you. Um, we do, we're very liberal about doing starter kits and development systems, so if you wanted to do a proof of concept with us, we'd be we're happy to discuss it. Go ahead. Yes, all these Android uh, devices, uh, is this uh, AOSD or uh, Google Android? Uh, okay, so that's a good question. So we kind of go both ways, and so in the Android world, there's a, Google is really reeling in the devices right now, <laughs> So they're, you know, back in four and five and six, that's the version of Android. You all probably had devices. Pretty much anybody in the world could build an Android device, deploy it. At 7.2, Google started reeling in, controlling what was deployed on their system. So now you had to go get an approval. And Google has a full certification program. We are approving these devices right now. The one that's in your hand is not um, approved. That hosts a uh, software package from Dell. It's a um, AirWatch package for the device management. So they're not using, they're not really using the Google infrastructure for the remote updates. My company is developing that with some partners for doing that. Um, but to answer your question, that specific one isn't. Um, we are developing three products right now. Managing one of them is a fitness equipment. We are doing the GMS certification so that. If you want to run Netflix on your Google device, you now have to have an approval before you can do it. Five years ago, you could just get the device, go get the Play Store, and you could run your device. So um, there's so many devices that are being deployed in the embedded space. I think Google smartly wants to reel in what's out there so that bad things don't happen. Plus, I'm sure there's some commercial reasons they want to control it. But uh, that's a good question. Any other questions? I could talk here all day. <laughs> so you were talking earlier about edge computing and machine learning. Um, yeah. It does you don't support any NVIDIA hardware. Is that something? That's a good question. Yeah. We're a small company. Yeah. <laughs> so we can't do everything to everybody. Um, our previous company uh, that I worked at that owned us, we got all our stock back. We were an NVIDIA partner, so we made supercomputers. Mm -hmm. And so I got exposed a little bit, but mm -hmm. NVIDIA is hot. Yeah, I was thinking more about the Jetson. Yeah. Right. So I didn't talk about Qualcomm, I didn't talk about NVIDIA. So those are great parts that are very pervasive in the world. It's just not, come, we're not bringing any value, so that's why I didn't bring it up out there. And there's some other ones, IoT specific ASIC guys. My old boss, I worked for Lattice Semiconductor, I think he lives down here, Scott Hensley. He's working for one of these companies. There's a bunch of really cool IoT companies that are coming with purpose-built ASICs with all the IoT built around it. Hitachi has some really cool devices. 
Um, the ones I highlighted is what I, you know we're doing, and I'm sure the admin and the M&A guys have their, their special. So here's some of the customers that we're doing. Sorry about the, the graphics of it. You know, we're, we're doing cool programs for these companies. So if you see anything up there that's interesting to you and say, how did you guys do this or what it is, get with our guys in the back of the room and we can uh, talk to you about it. Just so in closing, we run uh, application ready systems and then we have a whole portfolio of uh, devices. If anybody wants to see the um, LoRa uh, application or sensor, uh, get with, with get with us at offline. We can uh, demonstrate it to you. Um, but with that, thank you. Let's give him a hand, guys. <laughs>